Hi, I'm Doug from Dynamic Computing and welcome to episode 114 of 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast. Uh, now, a few weeks ago, we started on an Amiga 500 Adventure series where we're talking about one of my old Amiga 500s that I bought in about 2018 or so. Worked okay for a while, keyboard fried, uh, and, and since then, she's been having some problems. Here's a link to the video from last week. This week, we're going to try and stabilize the patient and get her up and running and working reliably. Just to recap, <laughs> see what I did there? Uh, what I discovered was that when she would boot, which was occasionally, it would lock up within just a couple of minutes. Now, I'd done all the chip replacing. I'd put in new Agnes, new Denise, new CIA chips, cleaned all the sockets out. Um, and, and it got better. It was better than it was before, but it was still not perfect. I did find one area on the board that was definitely compromised. Here's a close-up picture of it here. Let's go ahead and take a closer look on the board itself. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to look at a magnified view of the board. And you'll see right here next to EMI 524, this resistor right here, We've got this little pad that's supposed to look like that little pad, but instead is a corroded yucky mess. And you look down at this trace, which goes down to the CIA chip, which uh, in theory, la da da da, there's the CIA chip. I think it goes down to one of these connectors here on the CIA chip, probably right there. I'm going to tone it out and just see how bad it is. But what we're going to do is we're going to clean that off with a combination of, of vinegar to stop any further oxidation. Then we're going to use, uh, we're going to scrape away some of the yuck and we're going to clean this up maybe with a little bit of an eraser and see if we have any kind of continuity between this pad and where it's supposed to go. And uh, if not, we're going to put a bodge wire there. Now, with the help of holding my cell phone light underneath here, you can see this is the pad that is so corroded right here. And if we follow the little trace all the way down, I took the CIA chip out, it comes down all the way down to right here, down to the lower right of the where the CIA chip normally is. Now, when I use my fluke to tone between here and here, I get nothing. But if I go to the bottom of the motherboard and find where this uh, little uh, pad, this little solder pad comes out at the bottom of the board and then tone it out to the location, which is right here, it gets a perfect signal, just solid connection. So what I'm thinking is we had some issues with this, the pad being so corroded and it was causing uh, maybe some problems. I cleaned this off fairly well, got most of the gook off of here. And while I'm not getting a signal from the top pad, I'm getting it from the bottom of it, which means the signal's still going through if my logic is correct. I may put just a dribble of solder on there to make it look pretty, but I think the actual connection between the two is actually working now. And now the mystery deepens. So I verified that that connection was good between those two points. I mean, I got a strong signal between the two of them. So I rebooted. I got a green screen, just a green screen. Green screen often means chip RAM, could mean Agnes. So I tried a few things. I tried it, putting the ROM in, taking the ROM out. And then finally what I did is I put some pressure on the fat Agnes chip and booted it up. And lo and behold, we got a Kickstart 1.3 screen. Tried it a few more times, same old thing. Sometimes it would boot and sometimes it'd give me the Kickstart screen. Sometimes it'd just be a white screen. Now I did try it with one of my diagrams. This is a Chucky Hertel's diagram. I got this from our good friends at Retro Rewind, which I'll be talking about in a minute. But I'm wondering if this isn't going to work because this is made with a newer EEPROM, the kind that my Amiga 500 Rev 5 just won't work with without modification because I get nothing with this. I just get a, a funky screen. But I put my 1.3 ROM back in, fine, works. I mean, tries to boot up okay. But I think there's a problem either with the Agnes chip or the Agnes socket. Let's take a closer look at those. 
Now, good old Agnes here. You see, I've got a heat sink on it. I did that because I just like to heat sink everything. Normally, I'd use a PLCC chip puller to reach down there and pull this little guy out, uh, which is fine. And I have one of those chip pullers and it works fine. But on a lot of these Amiga 500s and some of the Amiga 2000s, if you look in the bottom, Agnes has a couple little holes right under here that you can actually push something through there, something hopefully non-conductive and non-damaging, and just push right through there and it pops Agnes right out. So that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to pop Agnes out. We're going to take a closer look at her. Now take a look right here. This is quite interesting. Right here, we've got a pin there and a pin there that are most definitely not straight. Let's look around the other side of this little girl. There's a pin that's not straight. These look okay. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to carefully put those back where they're supposed to be, pointing the right direction. It is possible that one of these was just bent just a little bit, could have been bent for years, um, and just not making good, reliable contact, just making sporadic contact. So I'm going to bend these back into shape, but before I do that, let's take a look at the socket itself and see if we can see anything. Now let's take a look at the actual socket itself. This should be the Agnes socket right here. And what I'm looking for are any cracks in the plastic that would make it weak or any of the pins here out of place that looks like they would not make any contact. We're taking a quick peek. The actual socket looks like it's in fine condition. The pins seem okay in the overall scheme of things. None of them are pushed in too much. None of them are bent out of place. Now, if you guys see a crack in here that I don't see, make sure you let me know. But the socket itself looks okay. So I'm leaning towards the pins on the chip itself. So I'm going to repair those right now. So take a look at these pins now. We've got these two pins bent back the way they're supposed to be. And we've got these pins bent back the way they're supposed to be. Now, were these pins bent when I was testing it out after the keyboard fried and I popped out the uh, Agnes chip and reseated it? Could I have put it in a little crooked and bent it? Absolutely. But now we've got these pins back the way they're supposed to be. So we're going to pop little Agnes back in her socket since her socket looks fine and we're going to see how she works. By adjusting those pins on old good old fat Agnes, she has restarted to the kickstart boot screen every single time I've tried it so far. So I've tried it multiple times. So that's looking good. I'm, I'm actually feeling pretty confident about that. It's doing better than it was doing before. So are we done? <laughs> nay, nay. Now, recapping is an important thing that's talked about a lot in the Amiga community, especially with the Amiga 600, 1200, 4000, and CD32, because those machines use the little SMD caps, which actually tend to leak a little bit more than the through hole caps that the Amiga 1000, 500, 2000, and 3000 used. Um, it just had to do with the generation of caps that were put in there and, and really the quality. Now, when you think about it, these computers that, you know, Commodore thought, okay, we get three to five years of lifespan out of a computer. We're doing good. I was selling computers in 1993 PCs and we tell customers all the time. Yeah. Expect your computer to work between three and five years. And then something's probably going to go wrong with it. And it'll probably need to be replaced. A lot of times it was the caps that leaked all over the place. Now we're truly lucky that after 30 and sometimes even 40 years with some of the old Commodore 8-bit stuff, this stuff is actually still working pretty well with the existing caps in there. Now, the through-hole caps that are used in my Amiga 500, they might be just fine. But to be honest, the electrolytics in there could dry out. They're probably not going to leak, but they could dry out and it's going to reduce the quality of the signal that's coming through there and in turn reduce stability a little bit. The manufacturers, even back in the 80s, gave their capacitors a lifespan of 10 to 20 years, which is really good, but we're on, you know, 
almost 30 years for this Amiga 500, probably 32 years, something like that for this Amiga 500. It's gone past its, its reasonably expected lifespan. So even though it's not an emergency like it is with the newer Amigas to replace the caps, it's still not a bad idea. Now my machine here. This one was apparently in a storage unit since about 1993 in Texas where it gets hot in the summer and cold in the winter and it wasn't an air conditioned unit. The thing already had some oxidation damage that we saw in there and we, we did some repairs on. Um, so I'm just going to replace these caps. Now the last episode I showed you some caps from our good friends at Retro Rewind. Now these are actually the cap kits for the version 6A of the Amiga 500, which is in my checkmate case with my Vampire. I haven't re recapped it yet. So I needed to order some new caps specifically for the Amiga 500 version 5, which is the board that I have. So I picked these up from my friend Frank at RetroRewind.ca. Did I mention Frank at RetroRewind.ca sells cap kits for all of the Amiga models from the 1000 through the 4000 and the CD32 and for Commodore 8-bit computers, all of them. And did I mention that you can get 10% off your orders of capacitors or diagnostic ROMs or any of the other multitude of things that Frank has on his website. You can get 10% off by using my code capital T, capital I, capital S, 10 mark. You see it right down there, TIS 10 mark. You get 10% off your entire order. Use it as many times as you want. Order every day. And the cool thing is through December 18th, anyone who uses that code, anything that they save using that discount code is going to be given in charity to Daily Bread in Toronto, Canada, which is a uh, group to feed the hungry in Canada. This is awesome. Frank is awesome for doing this, donating everything that's been saved for the holidays. And 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast is going to be throwing in an extra $50 just right on the top of whatever you guys save using my discount code, just in the spirit of the holidays. And we've got a couple of groups uh, in the Amiga community who have a little friendly competition going. Whoever has the most discounts using their discount code, that group or organization gets two $50 gift cards from Retro Rewind that we're going to be allowed to give out as bonuses to community members, off in a raffle, whatever we want to do. We'll think of something fun to do with those because obviously 10 minute Amiga Retrocast, we're going to win. So even though the capacitors on this beautiful Amiga 500 board are in fine shape, literally I can't see any bulging, any problems with any of them, and they're all shiny and new looking, we're going to replace them anyways just because it's time. And to replace them, I've got some nice little tools here. Let's take a look. Over here, I've got a pretty decent desoldering kit. I got this off of Amazon. Now this has a hot air desoldering gun. These are mainly useful for um, like chips and uh, maybe some SMD capacitors. So we're not going to be using the desoldering uh, hot air in order to get these caps off. I also have this handy dandy solder sucker here. So I can use my uh, soldering iron to heat things up. And then I put this little guy down on the hot solder and boop sucks it right up. This actually works pretty good. These are like 10 or 15 bucks on Amazon. They're, they're really worthwhile. They're nice little units. Lastly, in the spirit of the holidays, I've got a turkey baster here. This is an actual soldering iron that has a little turkey baster pump on the top. The soldering iron itself has a little hole in it. See the nice little hole? And so you heat up the, the solder underneath the chip and you suck it right up and then you blow it out hopefully not on your lap or anything like that or on your arm but this actually works very very good and i think this is going to get a majority of the solder out now i also have plenty of solder wick and things like that in order to uh, you know do any cleanup work or anything like that my intention is to do this in quadrants so looking down at the amiga 500 motherboard here 
I'll say do this part first, and then I'll come down to here, do here, and do here. So I'll keep all the, the everything separated, and I'll know which capacitors go in which area because I'll only be doing one section at a time. That's just how I do it. Um, there's not that many capacitors we have to replace. In the bag, we have just a, a handful of capacitors in here that we need to replace. It shouldn't take too long. Now, I'm not going to do this part on video uh, because you guys don't want to see my lengthy desoldering process and laugh at me. So I'm going to go ahead and get this desoldered and we're going to join back up in a couple of minutes here after I'm done. So, recapping. Now would be a really good time to talk about how Frank from Retro Rewind offers a professional recapping service if you don't have the skills to do it yourself. Now, I'm not coming out and saying that I just recapped my Amiga 500 motherboard with his cap kit and now it doesn't boot because I think I screwed something up in the recapping. No, I'm not saying that at all. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's just fine. I'm sure I just powered up and it'd be just fine. Uh, yeah. Frank, I'm sending my board to you this week, okay? I screwed something up. Honestly, if you don't have the skills to do it, send it to a professional to do it. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. What I think happened is that while I was removing some of the caps, uh, I, I don't think I removed them quite the right way. They, they didn't come out very nicely at all. And I think there's probably just some, some kind of connection somewhere that's not making a good connection. So it just gives me a black screen now. Say la vie, send it away. I think you'll be able to fix it. That does mean I'll get it back in a couple of weeks and we'll be able to continue on with our Amiga 500 adventures. But uh, lesson learned, hey? Thank you though to my awesome patrons for all of the support that you give me. You'll see a list of the wonderful patrons scrolling by on the screen right now. Um, one of the thing that's new is on Facebook, uh, between Kevin Saunders and I, we created a group called Amiga Artwork. And that group is dedicated to sharing your artwork you create on the Amiga, not just pictures, music, uh, video games, whatever you create on the Amiga. Fair game for Amiga artwork on Facebook. I'll put the link down here below and I also have the link in the description. Please stop on by, join up. If you're interested in becoming a patron, pop on over to patreon.com forward slash 10 mark and you can help me pay for my repair on my Amiga 500 motherboard. <laughs> Thanks for joining me today in this very different 10 minute Amiga retrocast. Uh, please like and subscribe and uh, then comment and laugh at me for destroying my own motherboard. Um, but until next time, this is Doug from 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast, signing out.